Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On a weekly basis, the South African Bar Association hosts an esteemed speaker to deal with a legal topic. This is an initiative aimed at making an essential contribution to developing the skill set of all and any person who represent the South African public in our courts. It is my honor and privilege to introduce today's esteemed speaker. Our speaker today is Judge Graham Mushwana. Judge Mushwana shall be addressing us on a, on a topic titled, Under what circumstances can a restraint of trade agreement entered into between an employer and an employee be regarded as unfair, unreasonable, or unconstitutional? We are further favored to have, to have Advocate Tiboho Manchu to conduct the welcoming and conclusion of Judge Mashwana. In terms of housekeeping, these sessions are recorded and appeal to participants to ensure that your microphones are muted and that your video cameras are switched off. In that regard, during the address, all participants shall automatically be muted. Should a participant have a question, simply raise your hand using the Microsoft Teams platform. During the question and answer session, a humble request is made to restrict questions to the speaker relative to the topic under discussion and only pose such question when called upon. Without any further ado, I now hand it over to Advocate Manchu to conduct the welcoming of Judge Mashwana. Over to you, Advocate Manchu. Advocate Manchu, uh, your mic is muted. Thank you, Ahmed. Let me start by saying that although restraints of trade come from our common law of contracts, the enforcement is not unfettered like most agreements that have been validly concluded. Our courts have recognized that there's a need to balance, on the one hand, the protection of an employer's commercial or propriety rights against an employee's right to choose an occupation. From as far back as 1982 in the decision of Magna Alloys, the courts have recognized that it's necessary to temper the enforcement of restraints of trade with the requirement of reasonableness. And the introduction of the Constitution and the LRA has also given rise to certain nuances. So I think it's appropriate that a topic visits the question, under what circumstances can a restraint of trade entered into between an employer and an employee, an employer and employee be regarded as unfair, unreasonable, or unconstitutional. And even more appropriate is our speaker for the topic. Judge Mushwana is qualified with a BPROC, LLB, and LLM. He was, an, he was admitted as an attorney in 1997 and practiced as such until his permanent appointment to the bench in 2017. However, for the, from the period 2007 until his appointment in 2017, he had acted as a judge in the Labor Court. My experience of him as an opponent was that he was both formidable and very astute. I remember I had him as an opponent in a contractual dispute before the Johannesburg High Court. And his conduct in this trial, in that trial, demonstrated that his experience extended outside the labor court and that he was quite comfortable to traverse other areas of law. And this is evidenced by the fact that if you look up his name, you will see many reported judgments in which he appeared as a legal practitioner across various courts, including the Labor Court, the Land Claims Court, and the High Court. And if you've had the pleasure of appearing before Judge Mushan in the, in the Labor Court, then you'll know that he's taken his astuteness or he's elevated to the bench. Generally, most counsel will tell you that within five minutes of appearing before Judge Mishon, he'll ask you a very incisive question, which often goes to the heart of the matter. And if you're unable to give him a considered response, you're very likely to have a very long morning or afternoon. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Judge Mishon. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Manchu, and uh, thank you to all the organizers of this talk. 
I did not know that I I pose a threat to practitioners uh, when they appear before before me. But uh, I had always thought that I I am a a most welcoming judge that you can find in the labor court. But nonetheless, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> the topic today, it's, it's not an easy topic, I must say. It is, it, 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 it has a blend of the common law and the blend of the constitution. And the approach that was taken or significant approach that was taken by the South African judges, given the fact that this whole concept of restraints of trade stems deep from the English law. So the English law had a particular way of dealing with restraints. But as Mr. Manchi mentioned in 1982, I think it was Chief Justice Rabi, as he then was, changed the law in relation to the South African situation. Now, time permitting, I'm going to talk about seven topics or seven aspects. Firstly, going back to just the definition of what is a restraint of trade agreement or clause or undertaking as it is sometimes referred to. Then secondly, deal with the common law principle of factor sunt servanda. And thirdly, the principle of reasonableness. And fourthly, the principle of fairness. And fifthly, touch on the constitution. And then sixthly, touch on the aspect of pleadings, particularly in the labor court. And Lastly, leave you with my conclusions flowing from the topic itself. I understand the topic to be related to the fairness, reasonableness, and constitutionality of the restraint of trade agreement. As an opening gambit, a restraint of trade is an agreement which is formed by offer and acceptance, like any other agreement. That then brings me to the question, what actually is a restraint of trade agreement? What sets it apart from any other commercial agreement? let alone a contract in general. It is an agreement in which a party agrees with any other party, in this instance and for the purpose of this topic, the employer and the employee. The employee agrees to restrict his or her liberty in the present and in the future to carry on a specified trade or profession. Now, immediately just from the, the, the definition of this restraint of trade, one observes a restriction. Generally, contracts would have terms but this one is more unique because it brings to the fore a restriction. A 
And this agreement, generally, at a general level, the restraint of trade undertaking or clause or agreement would cover issues like one, a non compete. For those that may not understand <clears throat> what I mean by that, it is simply a clause that says if I lose my employment or leave my employer, I would not take up employment with a competitor of my employer. We'll see why as we, as we proceed with this topic. The second part of this agreement is the non-disclosure of confidential information. The third part would be the non-poaching, I call it, of customers or clients of the employer. And the last aspect would be for the protection of trade secrets. Mostly employers enter into this type of agreements in order to protect what is generally referred to as the proprietary interest. And this proprietary interest would be your A, customer connections, trade secrets, and confidentiality. I indicated at the beginning of the talk that this is one area of the law that is not easy to deal with because of the blend that I had alluded to. But of cardinal importance, the proprietary interest must be something capable of application in the trade or industry, something that is useful to the employer in this instance, and something that is not in the public knowledge or property, and must be known if at all is to be used for proprietary interest to a restricted number of people or a close circle. You will observe the importance of this as we proceed with the topic. And it must also be something that has economical value to the person who is seeking to protect. Like any other contract, once concluded, there will be rights and obligations. Now, in simple terms, an employer would protect its proprietary interest, and an employee would attract an obligation to respect the proprietary interest of an employer. Of course, as we discuss, or maybe in the question session, there could be issues which are very difficult in my thinking as to what is it that is there for the employee to really agree to restrict Um, his or her right to partake in another in, in in the profession in future or in a specified time. Obviously, issues that may creep in are issues like 
is this a fair contract where employees would, in some instances and in some of the cases that we had dealt with in the labor court, where an employee says, look, I signed this agreement and uh, at the time I was looking for employment and, and I had to take what is on offer. But now that I see its restriction, I, I feel like, or with, as they say, with the benefit of hindsight, I should not have signed this because it was unfair. Now, the English law was such that it would expect any person who's seeking to enforce such an agreement to show that it is a reasonable restriction and or agreement. Taking into account that courts are there to effectively ensure that there is fairness between the parties and probably the weaker party, in this instance, the employee, it's not really put at a disadvantage. But as I indicated, the position in South Africa became a little different in 1982. So the, the, the employee attracts an obligation to respect the proprietary right. Mr. Employer, you're going to expose me to your trade secrets. I undertake that when I leave, I am not going to expose your trade secrets to your competitors, to any other person who may find that information useful. Now, the concept pacta sunt servanda. It's a common law principle. But of course, it is a Latin phrase that simply means agreements must be kept. In terms of this principle, Obligations created in terms of the agreement must be honored. The majority of cases that come to the labor court, for instance, relate to the non-compete clause. As I had indicated earlier, that the non-compete clause is simply saying I, I restrict myself to join a competitor because of the, the employer thinking at the time, or at least the reason being that if you join my competitor, there exists a potential that you will disclose some of my trade secrets, some of the confidential information to my competitor. So, as I pointed out, in a non-competitor situation, the employee agrees to a clause, for instance, that says that upon termination of employment relationship, I, as the employee, shall not, for a specified period, not take up employment with a competitor. Therefore, and, and, and perhaps I, I must pause and indicate which, 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 which aspect would lead to the issue of fairness at the later stage. That oftentimes these type of clauses or undertakings are entered into in happier times. And by that I mean when the employee is obtaining employment, and there is a particular package that is being offered to the employee, and he's happy with that. 
10 years later, probably having forgotten about the, the restraint of trade clause, he then terminates employment. So in that instance, once an employee terminates employment with company B, then for a specified period thereafter, he or she is obligated not to join company C, which is a competitor of that company B that employed him earlier or her earlier. And, and that general principle or that, 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 that obligation arise because of the principle of factor sui servanda. It then says that the employee must remember what he had agreed to 10 years ago. And he must respect that which he had agreed to or she had agreed to 10 years ago. Now, with the cases that come to us, employees would probably at times because he, he or she had forgotten that uh, she had agreed not to join the competitor. Join the competitor, good salary, and the employer would then discover that he or she or the employee has joined the competitor. Then at times, what we have seen in this court, in the labor court, is that employers will attempt to obtain an undertaking that uh, you had agreed that you would not join the competitor. This company is a competitor. Please respect the clause because you had said that you would not do that for a period or a specified period. Now, <clears throat> more often than not, such undertakings do not come to the fore. Then, an employer is sitting with a breach. Now, the breach of that principle, and that is the factor sum servanda, ignites an employer to seek an extraordinary remedy of interdict, and at times coupled with a declaratory relief in the labor court. And I may just mention at this point in time why the labor court ended up attracting this type of matters, which on the face of it appear to be contractual disputes, is because an employment contract is a contract that would be determined or any issue arising out of that contract be determined by the Labor Court in terms of Section 773 of the Basic Conditions of Employment. Now, in, in, in the past, the situation has always been that the High Court will deal with this type of matters. But with the advent of Section 773, the concurrent jurisdiction of the Labor Court came into being. Now, once a situation of a breach emerges, an employer is required in court now to prove, A, the existence of an agreement, and two, its breach, and three, the prejudice to any of its proprietary interests. Just to recap, 
an employer can say, your joining the competitor is in breach, firstly, of clause eight, as you agreed not to join the competitor, but it prejudices my interest of the trade secret, of the customer connection, or the customer list, and so on, that you had become exposed to. by virtue of employment. So should the employer, just as, a, as elementary, prove the existence of those three, then this court and the high court would be then obliged to order what either and this extraordinary remedy of interdict or order specific performance. Mr. Employee, unfortunately, on application of the Pacta Sun Servanda, you must comply with clause eight, for instance. Now, then, in this court, on matters of this nature, then kicks in the issue of reasonableness. At a general level, or as a general principle that has been established in the Magna Arm, or even the English courts, although in a different honor situation, an agreement that is unreasonable cannot be enforced by the court. I think it is it is a principle that emanates from your your natural law that courts cannot be seen to be enforcing unreasonable agreements. Now, it, it is important at this stage for me to distinguish, as it were, the situation of what do we mean by reasonableness? Because, for instance, in section 33 of the Constitution, there's a reference to unreasonable administrative action. But is that the unreasonableness that is being referred to? That is why it is important to have an understanding. What does reasonableness in law mean? In loose terms, I would say reasonableness must be something that is just, rational, appropriate, or usual in the circumstance. Therefore, Anything that is unjust, irrational, or inappropriate is considered to be unreasonable. This concept is linked in the context of the topic today to another legal concept or principle of public policy. This principle of public policy applies where an injury to the public good would arise. If an enforcement is perfectly legal for an agreement to be enforced, the, all the clauses of the agreements favors, there is a hand I see from Ahmed, no, no, you may, you may continue to judge. Okay. I'll it in the question and answer session. Thank okay, you. all right, thank you. Now, the, a perfectly legal agreement, as in its terms, may be one that will offend public policy or public good or the boni mores of the society. In that instance, a court of law 
is prevented from upholding and or enforcing such an agreement. Now, in the litigation context, where uh, there is litigation around the enforcement of the restraint of trade, since the Magna Allah's judgment, the law in South Africa is that one, the common law accommodates this type of agreements, that is the restraint of trade agreements. But if a party, for instance, an employee in this instance, alleges unreasonableness, that party must first establish the unreasonableness and prove such an unreasonableness. Of course, the test would be an objective one. In other words, a court would not uphold this defense if the unreasonable is one that serves the individual interest. Of course, as I indicated earlier, the starting point should be what do we mean by unreasonable? So because the test is objective, an employee faced with an application to enforce an agreement that he had concluded 10 years ago will always find that that is unreasonable. But that is subjective, and that's not the barometer that is going to be used or to be, uh, is to be used by the court. So, the individual interests do not come into the picture. All of that is because the Pacta Sun Servanda case says, you are bound by your own agreement. An important consideration is that public good must be one that prevails at the time of seeking an enforcement. Recently, this court, the Labour Court, and the High Court had to consider the impact of the COVID pandemic on the enforcement of a restraint. The High Court, in the matter that was before it, concluded that the pandemic enables a party to escape its contractual obligation on application of the public good principle, or in simple terms, for the unreasonableness principle. The Labour Court, in two of its judgments, one of which was penned by myself, and the other was penned by my colleague, Fanika J. Came to the conclusion that the situation of the pandemic cannot be used as a basis to escape liability. Because in our reasoning, what the Magna Alloys had in mind and as perfected in the children judgment was the circumstances that in terms of the public good would render those type of agreements unenforceable at that time. In my judgment, I also mentioned that you compare that with a situation where a contract cannot be enforced because of force majeure. But the situation of the pandemic did not and does not suggest that if people don't get employed during the pandemic, 
And ironically, in the matter that I was involved in, I said, the employee who breached the agreement obtained employment during the pandemic. So that suggested that it cannot be used. But on application of the stare decisis principle, it does suggest that the present position with regard to this question, which is of course controversial in itself, is settled by the two labor court judgments, which appears to be the recent judgment. Of course, there may well be that another high court may come to a different conclusion. Now, still on the unreasonableness, the children judgment had set out four factors that one takes into account in measuring the reasonableness. Just briefly, those were the interest to protect upon termination, is the interest threatened, weighing of the interest qualitatively and quantitatively. And also the public policy requiring acceptance of the restraint or rejection of the restraint. The High Court judgment relied on that last part to conclude that the public policy reject application of restraints during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another aspect which may lead the court not to enforce a restraint of trade other than reasonableness is where a restraint of trade is stated in broad terms that it becomes effectively unreasonable. For an example, you are prevented to join any competitor in the world for the rest of your life. So effectively, it's couched in broad terms. It is very difficult to find any reasonability around such a clause. Now, the principle of fairness. Fairness is a very elusive and very slippery concept. I may just point out that when it was first introduced in the context of labor law, as far back as 1924, the industrial, um, the, 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 the act that preceded the 1956 act. The approach has always been to say, well, let's call it an unfair labor practice. Now, in, in, in the olden days, or in the 1950s, a dismissal was an unfair labor practice. Anything else that has a touch of unfairness, it became an unfair labor practice until the 1995 Act tried to do some penal beating in terms of this elusive concept. But of course, time not permitting, but one can briefly mention that there's a, there's a judgment of the SCA or the appellate division as it was, the Fed judgment. It attempted to give this concept of fairness a meaning, but it still becomes, or it still remains elusive. Fairness is characterized by equity and justice. The veritable question in this topic is, is it fair to prevent an employee to work for a competitor simply because he or she some time ago agreed to that? 
on face value, it seems to offend the principles of fairness, justice, and equity, and equity to enforce a restraint of trade agreement by preventing an employee to work for a competitor. In due course, I will deal with the issue from the point of the constitution. But let me give an example, which is somewhat heartthrobbing in my view. Employee X improperly offers a discount to company B, the competitor of the employer. Since that exercise or that conduct amounts to misconduct, the employer charges the employee with misconduct, and the employee is found guilty and dismissed. And after the dismissal, the employee takes up employment with company B, which is a competitor, clearly contrary to the provisions of the restraint. Under those circumstances, I am sure that the attendees would immediately say, but that's unfair. Why do you dismiss an employee and thereafter you, you join the competitor and you want to enforce the restraint of trade? But once the applicant, the employer comes to court, he will come to court not under the banner of fairness, but he will come to court under the banner of the facta sum servanda. There's a clause. This man has agreed that he will not be employed by the company. Now, of course, an employee may raise the issue that, but he has dismissed me. Now, that issue had arisen in the SCA, and it was a very difficult question. And the court said that fairness of the dismissal. It's not a consideration when it comes to the enforcement of the contractual obligation. Now, the employer will still be entitled to obtain an order, even if the employee may take a view that it is notionally unfair because I have been dismissed. And of course, those set of facts would appeal to a judge's sense of equity. But it is settled law that what then becomes applicable is the factor suit servant. So fairness conceptually is different from unreasonableness. Thus, for an employee to escape the attracted obligation, he or she must show that the enforcement offends the body mores of the society, the public good, and not his or her own mores. Of course, this may be a different assertion that certain clauses of a contract are unfair, which one would see more often in cases of consumer protection in terms of Consumer Protection Act. But now in this instance, we're not talking about a consumer protection agreement or a consumer contract. We're talking about a contract of restraint. The, the understanding of the law, and then there's an English case that put it nicely, it says that when you conclude an agreement of this nature, you are in the same footing 
as the employer. You are equal partners in terms of agreement. In other words, an employee may say, look, I'm not going to take up employment of this nature because I've got this trade and profession if it is going to be conditioned on that. And if the employee does that, so be it. Now, <clears throat> I'm now turning to the issue of the constitution and I'm, I'm just going to be brief in a sense because I don't think time is still permitting. But <clears throat> quite often in our court, what arises is the provisions of section 22 of the constitution, which reads, every citizen has the right to choose their trade occupation or profession freely. Now, of course, the framers of the question in this topic had in mind, I would assume or surmise, whether preventing an employee to apply a trade, would that be constitutional? That question, was answered by the SCA in the Siemens and Ready matter. And it concluded that there's nothing unconstitutional with the restraints of trade, as it was accepted a long time ago under Magna Alloys. And our constitution in terms of section 39 would allow the courts to develop the common law insofar as it is not inconsistent with the constitution. Of course, section 36, I'm sure everybody else would know about that, would also come in and limit rights like the one in section 22. But the question that would arise is, does enforcing a restraint of trade interfere with this right or basic fundamental right? Clearly, on a wider basis, it doesn't. Quite often, the employers, with a view of protecting their proprietary rights, would say you would not join a competitor for a certain period and in the certain area or within a certain radius. Now, if you want to apply Section 22, you are still in a position to apply your trade if you, for an example, you are a salesperson or salesman or sales director. You can apply your trade in other areas where they sales, but not with uh, uh, non-competitors, oh, not with competitors rather. And you can apply your trade even with competitors, depending on how the agreement is, is couched, outside the radius or outside the prescribed area. So on those bases, it cannot be readily concluded that <clears throat> all restraints of trade would not comply with the Constitution. Now, I then move to the last topic, as it were, the pleadings. I, I, I felt that it is important to address this aspect, and perhaps because of what we see in our court. More often than not, Courts are being approached, or the Labour Court in particular, under Section 77.3, in matters of this nature, are being approached by way of motion. Of course, I do not read Section 77.3 to mean that you cannot approach it by way of a stated a statement of case. Of course issues of agency and other related issues which we can deal with briefly would arise. 
but I, 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 I want to, I, I want to emphasize the issue of pleadings because employees would oftentimes raise the issue of fairness, raise the issue of unreasonableness during argument. And when you look at their pleadings, they did not set out that defense. That's fatal. That's fatal to the case of the employee. It may well be, as I have pointed out, that an argument may be developed to say it is unfair to a point of unreasonable, to a point of um, offending public policy. But all of this, if it is not pleaded, it's unfortunate. Because of the short span of restraints of trade, this court is approached on an urgent basis. There are a number of judgments in this court, of course, varying in certain degrees, where the court would talk about inherent agency and um, other judgments and say, but you still have to comply with Rule 8. You need to show me why it is urgent. You cannot rely on the inherent agency. But the bottom line is, and in one judgment I had said, that the unlawfulness that creeps in is the breach itself. By the time the employers come to court on a non-compete law, an employee had joined the competitor. So now the, the prejudice is clear and it's possible and authorities are very clear. It's not about the fact that you can disclose the tra trade secrets or you are in the, in, the, in the process of doing that. But the question is, do you have the potential? You have the knowledge. You, you have a customer carried in the pocket, as it was mentioned in some sense. So now, in my take, they are naturally matters of this nature. Urgent. Now, I need to conclude. In summary, the restraints of trade constitutional, where unreasonability is alleged, the alleging party must prove fairness as a concept does not necessarily play a role. And where section 22 is raised, facts must be provided to prove its application. Absence thereof, the court cannot simply conclude that because there exists a section 22, therefore, I should not. Mr. Manchu, when he introduced this topic, he said, there are two competing interests which requires balancing an application of value judgment. And that is the issue of the PACTA, Sunt Pervanta, and the constitutional right to apply the trade. That balance, striking that balance, Chilwen attempted to give an answer, but I still take a view that it is not easy. And it is for that reason that I had said at the beginning that this is not an easy topic. But I hope that I did my best to explain to whoever listened. And I want to believe that the organizers would agree that I attempted to deal with the topic, although maybe not as pointed as maybe other people would have expected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Mishona. Uh, speaking on behalf of the South African Bar Association, all, this, all the participants, as well as those that will be watching your address at their leisure, I can confidently say that such address was remarkably informative, especially in a sense that you have addressed Force Mayor during this current COVID-19 pandemic. I have now opened the platform for a brief question and answer session. To those that have a question, please raise your hands in the Microsoft team. 
when your name is called, simply allow <laughs> to pose your question directly to Judge Mishwana. I shall initiate the question and answer session. Judge Mishwana, I require your comment on a submission I put before you. First, I refer you to relevant sections within the Constitution, that being Section 22, which is the right to freely choose your trade, occupation or profession, and Section 23, where the right to labor practices are enshrined therein. Secondly, I refer you to the Competition Act, which from my understanding of the Act does not provide a clear definition of unlawful uh, competition, but proposes to prohibit same through its purpose. Thirdly, I refer you to, to two case authorities, the first being Waste Products Utilization PTY Limited versus uh, uh, Vulcans and another, the second being Yonka and Forwarding Africa Transport Services and first Monaka Africa and others, better known to us all as the Pitts case. From my reading of these judgments, of which I stand to be corrected, both judgments advocates that an entrepreneur's previous employer will not be able to restrain them from continuing with starting their own company if the business is carefully considered not to be in violation of the principles as set out within those two judgments. In essence, if the entrepreneur does not make improper use of that information gained from previous employment, whether it's a springboard or otherwise, to obtain an unfair advantage for themselves, and the previous employer does not suffer damage as a result of, as a result of such use, a litigant will have difficulty to enforce a reasonable trade. Accordingly, from the, from the provisions I have stated in the Constitution, read with the, with the Competition Act, read together with the two judgments I have just stated, I humbly submit that a restraint of trade should not be used to prevent the entrepreneur from entering into the economic trade again, but rather to proportionally protect the interest of the previous employer against improper use and abuse by the ex-employee. What is your comment on such submission put before you, my Lord? <laughs> Thank you very much, A. Eh? Firstly, Section 22, I think it is what it is. And it says that it is a basic right or a, 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 a fundamental right. Of course, when anybody considers Section 22, must at the same time look at Section 36 and must at the same time look at Section 33 of the Constitution relating to the place of the common law, the international law, and so on. Section 23, it, it is more related to the rights or fair labor rights, if I may call it. And Section 23 says that a legislation would be passed to give effect to the rights that are contained in that section. So we know that uh, acts like the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, are those acts that are passed for the purposes of the <coughs> giving meaning to Section 23. Now, the Competition Act, of course, it covers issues related to competition. The competition in the context of a restraint of trade would arise in two instances, particularly for a former employee. One, in an instance where you can join a competitor. Two, in an instance where you set up a boutique kind of uh, entity that which is aimed at competing with the employer. Now, the employer, being the holder of the proprietary rights, is entitled to come to court seeking to protect those rights. Now, those two cases that you refer to, when it comes to the use of the information, an employee may be exposed to trade secrets, 
confidential information. Now, if an employer puts up a case to say that there is a potential that this information may be used in order to affect my proprietary value, my trade secret. Now, I want the court to interfere. Now, the, the courts always would look at what is the potential, not what is happening. And oftentimes, employees or, come, or, or this um, uh, uh, boutique owner would say, but no, I don't even contact, I don't even have the customer list with me. The issue is, did you at some stage have an exposure? And what is the potential? If the potential is such that you can disclose that information, then the court. And that is where that balancing act comes into the picture of these two principles that are actually at loggerheads, as it were, with each other. So in, 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 my, in, my, in my comment, um, it all depends on the circumstances of each case. Yes, I don't know whether it covers your, you your have, question. You have, indeed, you have indeed. Thank okay. you so much, Judge Mashwana. Judge Mashwana, there are a number of other questions. However, time does not... Yeah. And I have now closed the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. I now hand it back over to Advocate Manchu to conduct the conclusion. Over to you, Advocate Manchu. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, Judge, unfortunately, we didn't have enough time. Yeah. But we'd like to thank you for addressing the seven topics. For, from these seven topics, we can see that, as you, as you put it, the question of enforcement of restraints of trade is not an easy one. And it's impacted by so many considerations, as highlighted in your in your various topics. In fact, each of these topics could probably uh, deserve an afternoon uh, on another Thursday, um, which explains why we had uh, constraints this afternoon. So we'd like to thank you very much for your insightful uh, presentation, um, and I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. What remains is yet again to sincerely thank Judge Mushwana for his illuminating address and naturally for his time. We further thank Advocate Manchu for his excellent welcome and conclusion and obviously his time too. The South African Bar Association is indebted to you. Appreciation to all those that have participated virtually and shall be watching this session at their leisure. These sessions are recorded and the recordings can be found upon the South African Bar Association website, that being www.rsabar.net. I thank you. Thank you.